What do you see is the difference maker for healthy, long-lasting love? Yeah. For decades versus those that stay married a long time but aren't happy yeah. and those that eventually get divorced? I think the statistics are something like 50%, right? So 50% of all marriages end in divorce. Uh, the the illusion is is that the fifty percent that are left are happy. No, they're not. No, yeah. they're not. Maybe right? maybe fifteen percent or maybe, something. Maybe yeah. right, and we don't really know. I mean, like if you went and polled everybody, you might be even shocked. It's five percent or maybe knows? right. Gosh, why um, are they so challenging to 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 be healthy and happy in the long term for so many people? Well, I think part of the deal is the bar's very low. So the bar's something like we get along. Right. Like, that's it. I've got t-shirts I get along with, right. you know? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. So then what's it really all about? If that's the struggle, if the struggle is to get along, like I said, that's a very low bar. You get along with lots of people. Right, right. I mean, I get along with the person who, you know, makes my coffee at Starbucks, right? You know, I mean, but really what I've found to be the case, and it's not, I'm not looking at like particular people, for example, uh -huh. right? But I'm going to look at, like, what keeps a human being involved in anything, right? So, like, why does somebody, like, so I love to play guitar. Why? Right, why? Because I engage with that thing. I'm curious about that thing. I want to get better at that thing. I like how it feels when I accomplish something in that thing. If you take that in any aspect of your life, the same thing holds true. So my relationship with my wife is a function of who I am in it. And I need to keep bringing that to it. That's, there's no time when this is a done deal. You know, I have to keep showing up here, not for like for longevity, which is I think where a lot of people get messed up. People look at the relationship like, well, I can't do this for the rest of your life, the rest of my life. And I'm like, well, you don't have to. You just, just have to do it today. Right. right. Yeah. Like, right. It's like being on a diet. Yeah. I don't need to be on a diet for three months. I just need to be on it right now. Yeah. And that is moment to moment to moment to moment to moment because that's really all you have. But so what I do notice is that the areas of life where you are m flourishing most, there is some profound relationship you have between what you say and what you do. There's a profundity at play. Mm -hmm. So if you look at any area you're successful, you are literally doing what you said you would do, mm -hmm. even when what? I don't feel like it. Yeah. Right? Marriage is the same. Marriage is the same. Marriage, and I talk about this in the book, I say, especially in the Western world, but you look at, and I'm using marriage as kind of a model, but it applies to all relationships. Okay? Yes. But in a marriage, there's this ceremony, there's this coming together. Or you make an agreement, a commitment. Very good. And you and use called, words. And it's a vow. Yes. Right? And, and I talk about the bankruptcy of the vow mm. in a marriage because nobody vows anything anymore. Or they vow it, but they don't live up to the... Well, because they don't have a relationship to a vow. So we're not going around in life going, I'll vote to meet you at three o'clock. Right, right. Right, nobody's saying that. But 200 years ago, when you vowed something, the American Declaration of Independence is just people vowing. They brought something into existence on the strength of what they said. Yes. There was no fighting. Well, there was some fighting. But they created a nation from words. Right. Right. I mean, that's what that is. That's like a, well, it was a declaration, right? We're declaring we're independent. Well, what do you mean you're independent? Well, we just declared it, so yeah, we are. Yeah, yeah, right? yeah. And we vow our lives in our sacred honor. And most of those people gave, literally gave their life for that. They literally gave their life to that promise. I bet they were scared. Absolutely. I bet they were intimidated. But their word was greater than that experience of themselves. That's the same in any area of your life. Like you have to start realizing that what you say is a big deal. And what you say to yourself is a big deal. A lifetime of constantly bending, shaping, and breaking your word to yourself will leave you with a diminished relationship to you. You'll never do great things because somewhere in there you think you're full of it. Because you've broken your word to yourself so many times. You're out of integrity with yourself. Very good. There's no, there's no power to those words what anymore. What happens when we are out of integrity so consistently with ourselves, or even one time with our word? Right. What happens to ourselves? Well, I mean, you got to start relating to what you say like it's important. Mm -hmm. Just like it's important. Start there. Like I, I said I was going to, and this is important, not because the thing's important, but what's, what I said to myself and my relationship to that thing is what's important. Yeah. So 
any area in life, like I said earlier, where you're powerful or successful, you'll see you have a very strong relationship to what you said. Very strong one. Sometimes- You're committed to that thing. There's just no question for you. Like it's on like Donkey Kong, you know, you're just doing it. Why is it easier in some areas of life than it is in others to be consistent with what you say right. and what you want to do? Right. And that's eventually, it's great that you kind of put it that way because that's the path you'll follow. Uh huh. But the real strength of you is when you can say something. Like, for instance, when I was in my mid 40s, you know, I said, I'm going to produce authentic wealth. What's right? the difference between authentic and inauthentic? Yeah, I'm doing it for that, not for anything about me. Mm -hmm. which was wild for me because everything up to that point about money was all about fixing something about me or my life. And I was just doing it to see if I could do it, which I'd never done before. And I'd never fully given it that attention, like just for that. And so I, I put a number on it, which was cr a crazy number for that time in my life, like crazy number. Like For your 40s or what? How much you want to make? I was 45, yeah. And, and, I was, and I said, I'm going to do it. I'm going to use my 50s for that and I'm going to produce it, right? I produced it by the time I was 52, and I only really started when I was 48. Wow. So I did it really fast. The amount of money that you the wanted to The amount of money that I said, but, but it was wild because I had no attachment to it. What do you mean? Like there was no emotion in it for me. There was no like desperation, no like I got to do it, and nothing, no burning. It was just like I said I was going to do it, and I'm doing it. Mm -hmm. and so I ended up with this really kind of flat relationship to in, between my words and my actions. Like it was flat. Like there were days when I felt like doing it and there were days when I didn't feel like doing it. But the interesting thing for me was when I declared that, when I said I was going to do it, like the Declaration of Independence, I had no idea how I was going to do something like you that. Know, like, you just none, like yeah. I don't know how you even, I'm not a money guy, wow. you know, I'm not. But now it's game on because I created the top of the mountain in my speaking. So I spoke the top of the mountain in the existence. And then you figured out how along the way. But that's no the game now. The game, people say, well, you know, how do you even do such a thing? Well, that's the first question. <laughs> how do you even do such a thing? Yeah. You know? <laughs> and, and you might have to engage with that question for two years or three years or four years, but you've got to be actively resolving some of that stuff for yourself. Well, it's the same in love. Like I'm committed to the most loving, passionate and adventurous relationship that's possible. That's the top of the mountain. Mm -hmm. The top of the mountain speaks to me every day. It's, it's, I can tell whether I'm walking that path or not. That influences this. It's not even necessarily about that. It's more about what that does with this. Well, how does that shape me today? How does that, am I lining up with what I said mm -hmm. or not? And if I'm not, I might have a lot of reasons, excuses and justifications for that. But at the same time, am I going to treat that like it matters to me? Mm -hmm. Or am I going to just be like, well, you know, so far so good. Or it's been a tough week or, you know, there's a lot in my mind. Yeah, or, yeah, you know, yeah. or you're being a jerk. Why am I loving with you? Um, because I said I would. Mm -hmm. And that's what matters to me. Yes. That's what matters. That I said I would matters to me. Someone once told me that the key to his success in relationships was 80% of it was who you choose. Yeah. 80% of the relationship success is, yeah. you know, how you match well with the person yeah. you're choosing. Yeah. You only spent, a, I guess, a year with the person that you chose. Yeah. Did you know that when you were choosing this person? Did you were like, okay, I feel like we're going to be in a great alignment with our values and our yeah. vision and yeah. our lifestyle? Or was it more of just a feeling that you felt connected to this person and you decided? I did what everybody does, right? What everybody does is they get in a relationship because they feel as if this person resolves something about themselves. Mm -hmm. That's what I did. And so there was something about this woman that I thought, wow, like being with her, everything seems right. Like I feel good about me. <laughs> right, right. I didn't right? feel good in talking about her. <laughs> right. I, like, I, like there's something getting fixed here. Uh -huh. So no, I'm, I'm not that pragmatic. Yes. And I think most people aren't that pragmatic. And I think... There's an illusion out there that somehow you'll find the one. Mm -hmm. And really, I feel as if the job is to explore what's possible between you and this person, whoever that person is, and their potential and your potential. And so it was less about having, like finding something that matched up with me, which I, I don't know if that would work for me. It might work for some people, but I don't know if that would work for me. What was really captivating for me at the time was being with her 
had me feel a lot better about me. And I think, I really fundamentally believe that that's what most people go into relationships for. Is that the right thing to look at or is it? No, that's an absolute. <laughs> it's a recipe. Because yeah, then you're always complete, relying on that person to make you happier. Well, because whatever that thing is that they satisfy for you is something you haven't sorted out for yourself yet. Right. You so eventually you're going to have to do that. Otherwise, you're always needing that from someone else. Right. So you go in there and they're the solution and you end it with the notion that they were the problem. Ah, wow. And what's consistent in all of that is you. Right. I mean, I don't know if anybody's ever noticed this, but in every crappy relationship you've ever had, it's got one common denominator. That's you. <laughs> right. This, it's always you. This is a big awakening I had after my previous relationship ended. I was like, man, it's been 10, 15 years of relationships that, that, yeah. that started and then that crumbled in some way or that fell right. apart. Right. And the, the core of all those things was me. Right. Was my choices, was my... Getting into the, attracting those relationships was this commitment to those relationships was the unwinding of those commitment those relationships, and so why was I choosing these types of relationships? Right. What was unresolved within me that I get to take a look at now, or am I going to keep repeating this pattern until I address the thing inside of me? Right. So what's great about your kind of pathway, if you like, you can't. First of all, you've got to be able to look at that distinct from blame, right? And right, I, right, I know right. a lot of people just heard what you said and thought, well, but what if it is them, right? I know a lot of people, people sitting there right now going, dang, I did say that to myself. And I say, well, if you take away, like, who's to blame? Yes. And so sometimes people say stuff like, why do I keep attracting these kinds of people? And I say, well, what if it's not attraction? What if you are literally looking for them? What if it's you're seeking something about that person that, initially solves what you're dealing with, right? But will allow it to keep perpetuating. Mm -hmm. Like it keeps showing up and showing up. I call that a, an identity relationship. There's something about you, and it's the same for the other person, right? that when you get past all the stuff, whatever's incomplete will keep getting activated there. It'll keep showing up. So when you, when you start to see it like, oh, these are just two human beings yeah. <laughs> doing what human beings do, then it's, it's not personal, which is radical when you get it like that. Like, it's not personal. It's uh -huh. not personally them, personally me. Like, these are just two beings trying to work this out and what, work what out? Well, essentially work themselves out. Yeah. So that's why I insist with people, the greatest work you'll ever do you'll ever do is to get complete with your first 20 years of life. So true. First 20 years. Because everything after that is a reflection of it. I spent 20, so true. I spent 26 years in Glasgow. 26 years. I've been longer here. Right. And I still identify with that like it's me. But I've been longer here. And it's some of the colloquialisms and the traditions and the, like I identify with that mm -hmm. because it became so imprinted. You know, in, in my second book, I talked about you're the little magic sponge and you, you're, you're, you're not soaking up all of life, you're soaking up the bits. And then when you hit about 20, that little sponge just hardens. And whatever's in there, that's it. Yeah. It's in there. And that's what you use. Right. All, that logic. And until you awaken to that and realize that all of that that's there is really only a potential you. Mm -hmm. There's so much more. If you think about it like um, quantum physics, right? Like multiple universes, endless universes all happening at the same time, multiple potentials. Well, that's every second of your life. Every second of your life, there's a myriad of potential yous that could be talking right now. And what you typically do is the you that you did the second before mm -hmm. and the second before and the second. And so it perpetuates yeah. until you get aware, until you start to be like, oh, I I'm not stuck with this. I could literally be somebody else when? Right now. now? Yeah. Right now I could be somebody else. Right now I could say something else. You're generating the relationship. Right. So you're bringing to the table, right? You're constantly bringing to the table. That is a point though for many people where you stop bringing it to the table quite as much, you're spending more time looking at what's on the table.
Mm. Which invariably becomes, what are they bringing? What are they bringing to me? Right. 